Tomorrow, a top influential Democrat will stump in the early primary state of New Hampshire, but there's a catch. It's not Joe Biden. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, the other Joe here in Washington, who hasn't ruled out running for the White House next year, will headline an event hosted by the organization No Labels. If you haven't heard what uh, No Labels is, it's a centrist group that could launch a third-party presidential ticket, possibly upending the 2024 election, and that's giving some Democrats a little heartburn. I don't you know, think uh, No Labels is a political party. I mean, this is a few individuals uh, putting dark money behind an organization. And, and that's not what our democracy should be about. I'm obviously concerned about what's going on here in Arizona and across the country. Let's get some perspective now on that and more of uh, today's top political stories. Joining us now to discuss White House, former White House Press Secretary during the Clinton administration, Joe Lockhart, and Republican strategist Doug High. Uh, Joe, let me go to you first. Uh, since we're talking about Joes, uh, that's only natural. Uh, how do you rate the chances? Does does no labels have no chance or some chance? And, and what do you make of what Joe Manchin is up to? Well, I mean, they have no chance of a third party winning the presidency. They certainly have a chance of determining who the winner is. And I think that's what troubles some Democrats. I think there, there are voters, uh, a lot of voters uh, in the electorate uh, who are motivated by voting against Donald Trump, assuming Donald Trump is the nominee. I think what we don't know is what Joe Manchin's up to. Um, there are traditionally in many of these races, people who get in or talk about getting in to make a point, to try to move the party in one direction or the other uh, because they have an ideological bent um, and want to make sure that they moderate generally, you know, whether from the left or from the right. Uh, but what is clear, and you can look at, you can look at 1980 with John Anderson. You can look at uh, 2000, probably the most significant, where Ralph Nader uh, most definitely caused uh, Al Gore to lose the election, George Bush to win. These third parties have an impact, and usually a big impact, on who wins the presidency. Right, and maybe Ross Perot as well, uh, back in 92 uh, yeah. with, with your old boss, Bill Clinton. Um, Doug, if No Labels puts up a candidate of their own, I mean, what, what do you uh, think about this? Does this necessarily hurt the Democrats? Might it hurt Donald Trump? Might there be some Republicans out there who say, you know what, uh, I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden, but I'll vote for Joe Manchin, and that mm -hmm. does that hurt Trump? I mean, how does it cut, do you think? Well, the most important block of voters out there are those who voted for uh, Donald Trump in 2016, but after four years of Trump wanted to go in a different direction, calm things down, and voted for Joe Biden. They clearly don't want to go back in the Donald Trump direction, and so those are the voters that could potentially be peeled away uh, by a mansion, by anybody else who might run in a third party. And it's not a big subset of voters, but it's very specific. A few voters here and there in Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia makes a big impact, especially because third party candidates typically struggle to answer questions on what they really stand for, what their reason um, to, of existence is. I certainly remember Andrew Yang talking to you and struggling sure. to talk about what exactly the forward party was and what it meant. Manchin could have those same problems. That, no, that's true. Um, and let, let me switch gears, uh, Joe, and, and ask you about uh, what former President Donald Trump had to say uh, on Fox uh, earlier today. Let's listen to this. You didn't drain the swamp. I did. I fired Comey. I fired a lot of people. A lot of the people I had, I fired. I, I fired Comey very early. And, you know, there was a question as to whether or not you could. But I fired Comey. If I didn't fire Comey, I don't think I would have been able to serve out my term. I don't know if you picked up on the last thing that Donald Trump there uh, said. For as dishonest as he can be, he can sometimes be quite candid. Uh, candid. Uh, Joe, he said at the very end of that clip there that had he not fired Jim Comey, he might not have been able to uh, fill out uh, the rest of his term. Yeah, well, I mean, he still believes, or we're about to find out if he ever has to testify that he won the election. I mean, we can't expect um, uh, either honesty or astute political analysis from, from Donald Trump. I don't think he's capable of either. Uh, on draining the swamp, um, that's really a comical statement. He populated the swamp. He made the swamp bigger. He made Washington an entire swamp. There's no doubt that before he got there, uh, there were a number of special interests. It will, always wasn't and probably never will be a level playing field. But there was a level of corruption in the Trump administration that we haven't seen, oh, since probably uh, almost 100 years ago in American politics. And, Doug, I, this is a headline that uh, stood out to me. Ron DeSantis' campaign 
uh, confirming to CNN that it re recently let go some staffers after some new fundraising numbers indicated the Florida governor has been struggling to raise uh, money here in this early primary process. I mean, w what is your sense of it? This is starting to have some echoes of Scott Walker mm -hmm. back in 2016, the young up and coming Republican governor who ultimately couldn't gain traction. Mm -hmm. Um, does DeSantis have time to turn this around and catch Trump? It's not a good sign when you're laying off staffers at this stage. It's, it's certainly not a good sign. Yeah. And um, clearly, he's going to have to make, make some redoubled efforts on what he's doing on the campaign. The good news for DeSantis is he has opportunities to do so. Everything that we've talked about so far in this campaign is sort of conjecture until the candidates stand next to each other and have a debate. Now, Donald Trump may or may not be there, but if you're Ron DeSantis, you're going to have, a, or Tim Scott, or Nikki Haley, or anyone else who qualifies, you're going to have a lot of eyeballs there for you on several occasions. This is the time to make your impact so that you can move forward. If he's unable to do that, whether, again, Trump is there or not, then that's, this is not just an, uh, a problem that he's dealing with in July. It'll be an existential one. And, Joe, uh, let me ask you about uh, President Biden. His campaign and the DNC also released some new fundraising uh, numbers this week. They've raised a combined $72 million since April, apparently. Uh, do you think that's going to uh, quiet some of uh, the president's critics within his own party? Uh, there was also a New York Times a piece that said that perhaps the president is lacking in some of those small dollar donations, not to get too far into the weeds, but that, that might not be a good sign. What's your sense of it at this point? Well, I think it's an impressive haul of money. And I think if you look at his campaign, uh, it's very similar to Bill Clinton's campaign in 1906. It's going to rely heavily on the DNC on, on the money side. Barack Obama kind of set up a third organization really dedicated to his campaign that did a lot of that work. Uh, for Biden, he's relying on the DNC. He, he, he you know, charged them with coming up with a big number. They did it. Uh, I think it has an impact on uh, someone who might think about challenging him. But I think we're kind of past that among Democratic uh, stalwarts. Uh, the ones who were thinking of running were all doing it on the condition that Joe Biden didn't run. Uh, there's no reason for them to think that they can get in at this point, which is why I think if you're sitting in the, in the, in the Biden headquarters, you feel pretty good. Uh, Trump is winning two to one, three to one. Uh, he's the best candidate for them to run against. They've got the money. They do need to worry, though, about this third party candidacy because it does take the race and change the dynamics. And when you're sitting in the White House, you want the dynamics to say exactly the same. Yeah. And Doug, finally, I, I want to show this video of Republican presidential candidate Asa Hutchinson, who's been deeply critical of Trump, um, was repeatedly booed and heckled during this speech at a, a, a conference that uh, was held by a pro Trump organization. Let's listen to it. Let's watch. Doug, uh, what is going on here? I mean, uh, Asa Hutchinson is a lifelong Republican, has been an extremely loyal Republican for, I mean, decades. And yet, uh, I mean, he has been critical of Donald Trump. Is that simply the reason here why he was treated in this fashion at that Turning Point Conference? Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. like if, if you watch a baseball game, so, sometimes the announcers say, well, they're not saying boo. In this yeah. case, they sure were, and they were saying it over and over again. For the real Trumpy part of the base, the question is always, what have you done for me lately? Mitch McConnell, who did more to get through Donald Trump's legislative agenda than Donald Trump did, sometimes gets boos from, from those members of, of the real Trump core base. So it's not surprising when what Asa Hutchison does is what nobody wants to hear, is when you go see a band and they say, we're going to play some new material. The Trump base doesn't want new material. They want the Trump talking points over and over again. Yeah, and they don't want to hear you going after Donald Trump. I mean, they're just... At all. At all. And, and it seems to me that the more he does that, the more of a reaction he's going to get like that wherever he goes. No question about with it. With the base.